Hi, my name is Conzo Martin, and welcome to It All Counts Podcast. This is my first episode, and I'm very excited to get started. Most people know me as a college basketball coach for over 20-plus years. But now I'll take you back down memory lane, my story, where I come from, and how I got to this point today. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. My mom moved to the Illinois side, East St. Louis, when I was about four years old. I remember great times growing up with my brothers and sisters, playing with the kids in the neighborhood. I had a love for sports, and my favorite sport at that time was baseball. I would never forget Jackie Robinson, Corey Lee, playing baseball. It was so much fun, great talent. I remember hitting the home run. That felt good, all those things. And around about the fourth grade, my elementary school coach, he was a basketball coach as well. He wanted me to play basketball. And he kind of introduced me to basketball outside of playing on hangers in the household. He introduced me to the basketball game. And I didn't really want to play because baseball was such a love for me. But he got me out there. And I, I remember scoring two points. I, I made a half court shot in the fourth grade because I wasn't good enough to be because it was fourth, fifth and sixth. And the older guys were a lot better. But I remember making a half court shot. And then as the fifth grade, I played and we were a lot better. My brother was on the team with me and he was the best player on the team. And we lost in a championship game to a school called Jackson. They had tremendous talent. They beat us in a championship game. But with that being said, I'm not a sore loser. But what happened was they were used to playing on the fiberglass backboards back then. People called them glass backboards. And we didn't get used to that. We played in the game. <laughs> we, missed, <laughs> we missed a lot of layups. We ended up losing the game. So we lost in the championship game. They were a talented team. And we all grew up together, played against each other in high school. Now I remember around junior high school when I really started to focus on basketball and it was, it was becoming real for me and the baseball, the transition of baseball and all of a sudden having success as a ninth grader in basketball, one of the better players in the area, which is a big thing in East St. Louis because the ultimate goal was to be able to play on the high school team, East St. Louis Lincoln Tigers. That was the goal. They were so talented, tremendous players. Those were kind of our NBA guys when we watched those guys play basketball. So the goal was to try to make East St. Louis Lincoln's high school team. And at that time, 7th, 8th, and ninth was considered junior high school, and 10th, 11th, and 12th was high school. So after the ninth grade year, you know, excited to be a, eventually get to East St. Louis Lincoln High School to be a part of that team. And I'll never forget our art school teacher, we were playing around. And we, I wouldn't say we skipped class. We were out in the basketball gym. And I got a volleyball. I went up to dunk the volleyball. I went up to try to dunk the volley, volleyball in ninth grade. And when I came down, all of a sudden, I couldn't put my leg down. I couldn't. I tried to get up, and I couldn't put my leg down. And what happened, as I looked down, I saw my bone sticking out. I don't want to be graphic, but I saw my bone sticking out of my leg. And it just, and it wasn't out of the skin, so it didn't pop out of the skin. And I couldn't put it down. And they eventually they took me to, to the doctors. And what the doctors said, there was a fracture. And I, I do remember asking the doctor one question, will I ever be able to play basketball again? So this is March, I think maybe March 18th, uh, 1987. And I had the fracture of the knee, so I had knee surgery. And back then they would put the cast on, uh, the plastic cast on your knee. So I had the cast on for about six weeks. And the funny part, I was walking down the street with one of my buddies and I had the cast on and the cast broke because I hit the, my foot stuck into the concrete, cast broke, you know, took it off when I got home and that was it. So, so it wasn't a lot of rehab <laughs> after the surgery. So, and again, just kind of going about my business, working on my game, getting better. And again, the ultimate goal was to play for East St. Louis Lincoln High School team. And when I got to the high school team, so many talented players, uh, wasn't sure how it would turn out. Also trying to strengthen my leg to be as best I can be as a basketball player. And I worked myself very hard to be successful and I made that team. But in that transition of trying to be a great basketball player, I stopped playing baseball. Uh, and, and that was a tough, that was a tough transition for me because my love for baseball was, was so big at such an early age. And all of my buddies, most of my buddies played baseball, but the transition for basketball was a goal for me. And that was a lot of fun playing for that East St. Louis Lincoln High School team under Benny Lewis, which one of the best high school coaches that ever coached a game in any state. And learned a lot of lessons from him. And one of my teammates, very talented, LaFonso Ellis, he was a guy we followed his lead. Uh, and we ended up winning the state championship my freshman and my sophomore year. And I was a start on that team. And that felt good. 
And then that junior year, we came back when LaFonso Ellis left and the seniors left, and a lot of people didn't think we can do it. We won a second state championship, and that was in um, 89. And then going into my senior year, I'm not going to say we would have won the state championship because that would have been a tough thing to do because Chicago King was the best team in the country. Chicago King, Jamie Brandon, Johnny Selby, very talented guys, a phenomenal team. They ended up winning the state championship, and they were the best team in the country at that time, best high school team. So they beat us to go to the state championship, and they won it. I think they might have been 32-0. and The previous year, we beat them to go to the state championship. And so my senior year, around February, I had another knee injury. But we went to the doctors, and the one thing the doctor said, it won't get any worse, but at some point you will need to have surgery. And for me, it was just a matter of uh, I have to stay in here and fight with my teammates. So I was pretty much running down the court, you know, somewhat limping every time. But we were talented enough. We, we played our – Last high school game, so we were talented enough to make it to the state championship. We finished third in 1990, so it was a great run for us. And I played basically on one leg. And eventually going into the summer months, I had my second knee surgery around August of 1990 when I was ready about to go to Purdue University, which that didn't happen because I had to go to prep school before I went to Purdue University because back then – you had 1990, you had to make an 18 on your ACT test score. And most took ACT in the Midwest. You had to make an 18. I think I made a 17 twice. So I ended up going to prep school. So on top of going to prep school, New Hampton Prep, I also had the knee surgery. So I had the knee surgery in August. In September, I'm off to New Hampton Prep. And that was an experience within itself. Something totally different growing up in East St. Louis to now all of a sudden New Hampton, New Hampshire. And learning a new team, new staff, but it was a phenomenal experience for me. So now in the process of trying to rehab on my own with different weights, which I've never lift weights before, trying to strengthen that knee. So now this is pretty much the second time around where I didn't get a lot of rehab to strengthen the quadriceps and hamstrings of my knees. But I found a way to make it work through that season. We had a very talented team. We lost three games throughout the season to the same team, MCI, which is a very talented team. Uh, and they beat us in the championship. So after my prep school season, I was blessed with the opportunity to go back to Purdue as a freshman. And my freshman at Purdue was a tough one because of the transition. You know, talking about Big Ten basketball, very talented team, very talented players, and trying to fit in in that roster, but also learning and adjusting to the college game, but also the contrasting styles from the time I was in high school was more pressing defense back to a zone. When you transition to Purdue University, it's more man-to-man motion offense. So it's just a, an adjustment. And, and when I was in high school, I was more of a guy that played like a a power forward center slash row. I was more of a slasher, get steals, layups around the basket. That was more of my game. But when I got to Purdue, I had to learn how to play on the perimeter. So that means you have to learn the ball handling, making decisions with the basketball, being strong with the ball, shooting the three ball, shooting the jump shot, all those things was a transition and a real adjustment for me. And I'll never forget it was uh, my freshman year because I, I didn't start. I didn't play a lot early. And my freshman year was, I think it was around January 6th or 8th. It was a, it was a Wednesday, January 6th or 8th. And we were playing at Illinois. And hometown, East St. Louis, probably two hours from Champaign, Illinois. A lot of family and friends at the game. And we were playing against Illinois. And a lot of people thought I was going to Illinois out of high school, but I chose to go to Purdue. And I played about 45 seconds. I don't have a stat sheet. It's been so many years. But at 45 seconds, or maybe a minute and 15, somewhere around there, I played. And you're talking about humiliating. It was a tough thing to deal with uh, as a freshman when you were one of the top guys coming out of high school and not having an opportunity to play a lot in the game like, of that magnitude. And I'll never forget after the game, um, you know, I see my mom. We, we were about to get on the bus. I see my mom, and it was great. And and all she really said was, are you reading your Bible? And she said in so many words, of course, a hug and all that. And I, I think I said, yes, I'm not sure if I was really reading. I wasn't reading it at that time. I had it with me, but I wasn't really reading it. And that's all she really said. So it wasn't about 
complain about what coach wasn't doing, why coach isn't playing. There was nothing like that. It was just, are you reading your Bible? And she's more or less, you'll take care of everything else. Because the biggest thing with her was her son was in college. And she knew that was a great thing. That was the most important thing. Yeah, she knew I love basketball. But for her, her son was in college. And ultimately, the goal was to get a degree. And after that game against Illinois, I think I went in the coach office, maybe, you know, a day or two. And really what I did, I just asked coach, I said, coach, what does it take or what will it take for me to get on the floor to play? And, and, and pretty much, I don't remember every word coach said, but pretty much what he said was he was already saying it. But it was just the growth and things that I had to grow to, go through in order to be a successful basketball player, the things that I had to understand, not that you weren't talented because you are talented, but there are adjustments from high school to transition to college. There are intricacies about the game that you need to learn, the spacing, the ball handling, decision-making, playing on the perimeter, defensive assignments. So there's a lot of stuff I had to learn. So it wasn't as if coach wasn't saying it before. It's just all of a sudden when you're really not playing, you, you have a keen ability to really listen now. And I think that's what happened for me. And after that, I just did everything coach said and, and listened to a T, but also putting the extra work in because what happens when you transition back then from high school to college, you don't realize the amount of hours you have to put in on your own to be successful. Because oftentimes we think it's just enough. I worked out with practice. It was two hour practice or three hour practice, but you don't realize the extra hour every day that you have to put in to be an individual player, a talented individual player in hopes of making your team better. So I just put extra work in. But with that being said, the more work you put in, then you have to have boundaries. You have to have structure in your life. And so that means for me is minimizing, you know, everybody has a good time in, in college, the parties and the nightlife, but you have to minimize all those things when you're trying to be a successful student athlete. The time you have to put in in the classroom to be a good student, the work you have to put in to be a good teammate, to be a good leader, all these things is a culmination of what makes guys great players. And for me, at that point on, I end up starting. I can't remember which game I end up starting in. But once I got the starting spot, I never looked back and just really improved. And I've always taken pride in being a good defensive player. So that's what helped me stay on the court and play for coach, being a good defensive player. And I think going into that sophomore year, I really improved my ball handling, my decision making, all those things. But that sophomore year, I was able to bring the ball up against the press, make good decisions with the basketball. I worked on my three-point shot, <laughs> and, and I'll never forget the story. So I worked on my three-point shot, and Coach Katie said, um, again, Coach was a phenomenal coach. He's in the Hall of Fame. He's done great things as a coach and as a leader. But he said, he said, Zoe, because he would call me Zoe, he said, Zoe, I want you to stop shooting threes. And at that time, I was 0 for 6 from 3. And he said, just stop shooting threes. So I stopped shooting threes. Uh, and he said, you can still be a successful player, but just focus on other areas. And that was that was somewhat of a blow because I worked on shooting my three-point shot to become a better three-point shooter, and I had to stop shooting. But that was okay. I understood that because I was always about what's best for the team. And we had a good year. But going into my junior year, that's when I, I would shoot like 500 shots a day from the three-point line. And at that time, back in – 92, that's a lot of shots. 92, 93, that's a lot of shots. 500 a day. I would also work on my ball and I work on a lot of other things, but to really improve my three point shot. And that junior year, I had a lot of success shooting a three point shot. I think I might have shot 46 or 47% from three. I end up, I still hold the record at Purdue for three point percentage. I had the record for makes for a long time, but I hold the percentage. So in two years, I think I've made maybe like 179 threes, somewhere around there. And at a good percentage, because I put so much time into becoming a good three point shooter, but it, it took a lot out of me. Again, the sacrifice to give up some in order to get some, I knew I had to do that. So it was a great junior year. Now going into my senior year, I'm excited about it. We just won our first Big Ten championship in 93, 94. That was, we had Glenn Robinson, the big dog, was a great player, the best player in college basketball. We won a big, big Ten championship, 93, 94. Now 94, 95, a lot of people don't think we can do it because Glenn Robinson is gone. We come back and win the Big Ten championship again. But before that, October, I had my third knee surgery. And I'm sitting there, I'll never forget, I was one of my teammates. We were sitting on the bench, and I had to have the surgery. Sitting on the bench kind of after, after one of our classes. I just said, man, this is exhausting, man, just because of the, the amount of rehab 
that you have to do in order to be a successful student athlete. And for me, because of the previous knee surgeries, it was always rehab, knee day in, day out, running stadium stairs, extra work. But it was a part of a justice so I can be effective as a basketball player. And it just got to a point where it was exhausting, but I knew I couldn't give up. Because for me, uh, the love for my mom and the love to succeed uh, superseded everything else. So I knew I had to keep going. And so that senior year, <laughs> I'll never forget, we played in Hawaii. The first game, I'm just coming back off knee surgery. We played the first game, I might have had three points. Then we played the second game, I might have had six points. It was a tournament uh, in Hilo, Hawaii. And then the Rainbow Classic. Then all of a sudden, the last game, I had 27 points. We ended up winning the championship game against Iowa State, who had a very talented team. Their best player, Hoyberg, which was Fred Hoyberg, was a phenomenal player. And we ended up beating those guys in the championship, but it took a lot out of me. And it was just some growth pains for us as my senior year. And again, we ended up winning that championship, but it was a lot of learning lessons, uh, coming together as a team, a total commitment, but it was a fun ride. And after that senior year, I'll never forget the game. We, we lost the game to go to the Sweet 16 against Memphis, who had a talented team. And I was in that locker room. I was so exhausted, man, because it's like you, you give everything you got and it was like, what, what's next in life? Because again, you put the time into it. And I think when you put so much time into it, that you look forward to whatever's next, that transition, because you earned their right to move on. And now you don't really have any regrets because of the time you put into it. And for me, now it's uh, the NBA draft. And I felt like I was talented enough to play in the NBA. There was no question at all. But I, but I knew the one thing that would slow me up was the the knee surgeries, I knew at some point they look at the x-rays, the tests. I, have, I still have two screws in my knee to this day um, since 87. And I figured if they look at those tests and x-rays, it wouldn't be good. So really at that point, all I prayed to God about was just, just to allow me to hear my name being called. That was, that was the biggest thing because I knew, I knew I couldn't do it for a long time, but just to hear it because I put so much time into it and I worked so hard to achieve that. And I'll never forget uh, the 54th or 55th pick in the draft. His name was uh, Constantine Popa. And when they said, uh, in the, again, maybe 55, and the 55th pick in the draft, Constant, and I, said, I thought that was me. I was excited, but he said, Constantine Popa. I said, oh, man. So then I was called in the 57th pick in the draft uh, by the Atlanta Hawks. And that was a great experience for me just to, just to hear my name. Uh, it was a fun experience. I was excited about it and have an opportunity just to be a part. I, I didn't make it long with Atlanta Hawks, but just to be a part of that organization, uh, a legendary coach and Lenny Wilkins. So that was a great experience for me to be a part of that. Uh, then I spent time in a CBA, which is the Continental Basketball Association at, at that time, probably the equivalence of the G League today. Uh, and to be able to play in the CBA in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which a great, was a great experience, a lot of talented college players, a lot of play, a lot of talented players in that league, to be able to play in that league between 95 and 96, but also get called up by the Vancouver Grizzlies uh, uh, was a, a, a fun, fun experience for me uh, to play for those guys, to be a part of that, to make some shots in the NBA, to feel good about that. So now I can, that's, that was a story I could tell my kids that, you know, when I had kids to be able to tell that story, a fun story. And then the next year, stayed around the CBA and had success, playing for the Grand Rapids Hoops. Uh, got called up by Milwaukee Bucks, so that part was fun. And then that fall, fall of 97, had the opportunity to play in Avellino, Italy. So I went over there and played professional basketball. It was great, some of the best basketball I ever played because I was doing a lot of different things inside, outside, shooting a three-point shot, driving the ball, defending. It was so much fun. And I got over there maybe about August 5th or 6th. And around November, you know, uh, early November, I was on the basketball court and we were running down. I was running down the court and I was breathing like this. And then all of a sudden I passed out at half court. And when I passed out, the guys kind of helped me back in the locker room. And I remember the trainer, he couldn't speak any English but he was trying to say, when, when you came to Italy, you were big, but now you're small. But he would use gestures like his hand. He said, you were big, but now you're small. So I went from, so at that time, they did a lot of tests and x-rays. 
and I was normally 215 pounds. And so when they did tests and x-rays throughout that day and that evening, the guys on the team stopped by my place and just because I was headed to, back to the United States the next day. Uh, and my wife, Roberta, was there. My son, Joshua, was there. Joshua at that time was four months old. And I remember us, uh, the guys on the team talking to me about, yeah, man, this is, uh, make sure you get back to the States. Make sure you let us know how you're doing when you get back. And I'm thinking, man, I'm so exhausted. I'm not sure really what it was. And, you know, we get back to the States. My wife and I and Joshua, we, drove, we flew from Rome to New York, New York to Indianapolis where we lived. And so we got back to Indianapolis when I, when I, my wife and I, we were, so it was around 1.30 when we got back in the morning. Uh, so Roberto was kind of taking the bags and I had Joshua. And as I, when I got to the door, I had Joshua and I was so exhausted. And I just kind of put him down on the couch. I didn't really drop him, but just put him on the couch. And then when that happened, I was set over in another seat. And I said to uh, Roberto, when she was kind of moving the bags, I said, Roberto, we need to get to the hospital immediately. And I was just so exhausted. So we went to the hospital and we did tests, x-rays, they did blood work and all that. So I would sit around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning when the doctor came back at all. And he just said, he said, I don't know if you're going to die, but this is life threatening. And I, and I kind of took a quick glance at Roberta. I didn't want to stare at her. And I looked away and uh, he wasn't sure what it was. But eventually, a couple of days later, they found a tumor about the size of a baseball between my chest and lung area. And they found I was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a form of cancer. So I did chemotherapy for about four and a half months, and that was a real, real struggle right there. That was a fight. Uh, it was exhausting. I mean, there were, there were days, I'm, I'm on the couch, 20-hour days. But they did allow me to go home for Thanksgiving. They allowed that, and I'm not sure what they thought, if, if I would make it or not. But Roberta fixed the Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I don't even think I ate. I was so exhausted because she's a phenomenal cook, but I don't, I don't think I ate because I was so exhausted and I couldn't eat. And then they did chemotherapy for about four and a half months. Dr. Andy Greenspan did a phenomenal job. Uh, he, he was a great cheerleader, doctor, uh, promoter, encourager. He did all those things to keep me going. And uh, really, in the midst of it all, I just simply prayed to God, just allow me to see Joshua, my son, turn 18. And that was the, that was the whole goal for me. If Josh turned 18, God, then I'm fine. Uh, and, and Josh is, you know, 26 years old today, so life has been great for me. But just even battling through the cancer, uh, the struggles, the fight, just going through the chemotherapy. And, it, and, it, and one of the saddest, scariest things in all of that, when you go through the oncology office, when you go get your treatment, the people you see, uh, the people kind of come and go, but then also the people that don't make it because you kind of develop a, a camaraderie, a friendship of, uh, amongst each other because you're going through the same things, but then to see some people not make it, that's a tough, tough thing to deal with uh, and to see. So I'm grateful to be here to this day. Uh, and my last treatment was April the 20th of 1998. So I've been cancer free since. Uh, and that's been a great feeling. But even after the cancers, uh, that fall, uh, just going back to play basketball, I was able to go back to the Grand Rapids team in Michigan in late November. And I played with those guys. So I wanted to stay in the States just to be safe. And I stayed over there. I stayed in the States. And it worked out well. And Grand Rapids organization was great to me. And I played and had a good year. And we had a lot of time to play us. But for me, it was just to get back on the court. It was such a great feeling. So in 99, the fall of 99, Coach Katie had an opportunity for me to be a part of his staff. But the only thing is I had to go back to school and get my degree. So 99 and 2000 season, I had to go back to Purdue to get my degree because when I was in college, I never went to summer school because I always had jobs in the summertime. I felt like I could work, make more money in the summer to send money home. Not that I, I was obligated to do that, but I wanted to send money home to help the best way I could. But so I never went to summer school. Uh, I would always work on my game, work jobs. And obviously I did that. So I had to go back and get my degree, which with that being said, I thought that was a great experience for me because 
older, more mature, have a better grasp for what the experience is, the college experience, it really helped me. And I enjoy the experience of really learning because oftentimes as a student athlete, you're just going a lot on your plate, the academic rigors, the, the, the rehabs, the stuff you have to do to be successful on and off the court. But to be able to sit back as an adult to experience the college life was great for me to, to really appreciate the education, but also in that process, I was a junior high school coach at West Lafayette High School. I was a junior high school coach, and that was a phenomenal experience. All those young guys, they taught me a lot of valuable lessons, and those guys are very successful today. But just kind of really carving out a niche, so to speak, because it's easy to say you want to coach or you can coach until you sit in the seat to experience what that is. But to be in the, a head coach as a as a junior college, I mean, junior high school coach, that was a good experience to 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 kind of know when to call timers, how to go about it, sub rotations, all that. And it was fun. Then to sit on the bench as an assistant coach with the varsity team was a great experience for me as well. So I had a chance to do that while I was finishing up school. And then obviously the 2000, fall of 2000, I started on Purdue's basketball staff and their program, which is a, a, a tremendous experience for me, not only to be a part of it, but also to be under Coach Katie who was my college coach, but also like a father figure to me, uh, was a lot of valuable lessons and great experiences. And uh, I learned a lot from coach. And then coach transition with Matt Painter being the head coach. He came in as the interim head coach for a year and he became the head coach. Then also learning under Matt Painter, who was also my college teammate. So learning from him at a young age, a lot of valuable lessons as well. And then in 2008, I was blessed to get the head coaching job at Missouri State University. But I don't think I would have been ready for that if I didn't have the experiences with Coach Katie and Matt Painter as a coach just to learn things as an assistant coach because it's easy to coach a team. Not to say you don't have the, the mental capacity to do the job, but there's a lot of learning that takes place behind the scene as an assistant coach to be able to communicate to the team, to stand up at a podium as a pre at a press conference or an interview, all these things that you have to learn as assistant coach that you don't really get the opportunities behind the scenes because in most cases as assistant coach, you spend a lot of time with the growth of the players, scouting film, recruiting, so you don't get the day-to-day -day of what it means to be in front of a media and, and to deal with those outlets. So a lot of great experiences I learned by truly watching coach and Matt Painter, because those guys, there was a personal relationship there. So they were open to me developing and growing. So it's not as if they hoarded information. They really helped my growth. And so my transition to Missouri State was a smooth one from the standpoint being prepared. Now, once you're in that seat, it's a totally different ball game because there's a lot of learning as a head coach. So now my first time as a head coach, you, you have to go out and do alumni events. You got to speak about the program. And then what I found then, uh, Everything you say matters because you're the head coach and you're the program. You're the face of the program. So you have to be sound in what you're saying. You have to have accountability in what you're doing as a leader. You have to have discipline to do the right things. you got to be dedicated to the task at hand. That's an everyday assignment because ultimately, as a coach, your job is developing and raising and leading young men into men. And that's an everyday task. And I took a tremendous amount of pride in that. And um my first year at Missouri State, we won 11 games. And that was that was hard from the standpoint as a competitor. Not, not a problem with losing games. You can lose games. If you compete, you prepare yourself, you'll get the wins. But it was hard because you oftentimes, as a head coach, you feel like there's nobody you can talk to. Of course, I could have talked to my wife, Roberta. She was a very intelligent woman. She was in the corporate world for years. We had kids at the time, so I just felt like, why do I want to burden her with this information? We would talk, yes, but I didn't want to burden her with stuff that I was dealing with as a coach. And I, I felt as a young coach, um, I don't know why I felt this way, but to reach out to other coaches, hey, man, I'm struggling with this. You got any advice for this? I don't, I don't know why. If we feel that was a macho thing, I didn't want to do it, but I should have did a better job with that as a young coach of reaching out to other coaches that have been in it for a long time to get expertise on certain things. But then, but on the flip side, what helped me is through a lot of prayer. So now that means if I wasn't talking to anybody, I know the one person I could always talk to, and that was God to lead my path and direct me to keep me sound, to keep me focused, and to really help me. And I think that's what helped me more than anything. And eventually, 
as I got older and more mature in the coaching world to be able to communicate with a lot of people and that helped. Uh, so now today I take a lot of pride in helping as many people as, as I can to give it whatever advice I have. I've never had anything to hide in this game because I know everybody needs some level of assistance. So in that first year, Missouri State was a great one to learn how to deal with adversity, learn how to deal with struggle, learn how to deal with commitment, learn how to deal with consistency. And I'll never forget a story. We, you know, we lost, you know, several games in a row. And uh, and I was, I've, I've, I've always been a guy that early riser, get up in the office and get going and get to work. And not necessarily have to be the first one in, but I just, I wanted to get in there and be prepared to do my job. And I'll never forget after several tough losses, my wife, she would say, uh, you know, so many words, you know you're the leader of the program. So what do you want your staff and what do you want your players to see? And so for me, that said it all. So that's, I got that lesson in 2011, 2011, 2012. And I've been consistent since. I got it consistent since. I got to be in the office. I got to do my job. I got to be on task. And, and you can never let them see you flinch as a leader. You have to stay on course. You have to be committed to the task at hand. And she really helped me with that. And uh, because everybody goes through some, and, and what I learned too, those, those young men, they're looking toward you for leadership and direction. And more important, accountability and the last thing, a presence. They need to see you. And I, I try to display that every time down, every day in the office. Uh, my approach was consistent and it really helped me. And then the next year at Missouri State, we had success. We won a CIT tournament. Uh, and that was a great transition for our guys going into the third year to win the Missouri Valley Conference Championship. And that was a great feat for our team to beat some very talented teams. And that, and that Missouri Valley Conference is, was tough. And we had the championship game against Wichita State. Uh, Greg Marshall did a phenomenal job at that program. To beat those guys in the championship was a great, great feeling. Uh, then I had the opportunity after Missouri State to go to Tennessee, which is a great experience as a coach. And I went from Tennessee to Cal Berkeley. And I think Cal Berkeley was the next growth and jump for me as a coach, but more importantly as a leader. Because being out in the Bay Area, you learned a lot of things about culture, life, people, experiences, uh, and then the value. Uh, even though I, I've taken pride in making sure young men get degrees, but it has to be more than that to see if they can have, make sure they have successful careers, to be successful fathers, husbands, men, leaders, teachers. And Cal Berkeley uh, had a lot to do with that part, just to understand the world, the Bay Area, uh, what it was all about, the importance of the academic life, the importance of uh, your personal life, the importance of mental health, the well-being, all those things that really helped me in that experience. And I take a lot of what I learned at Cal Berkeley to this day uh, as teachings, uh, and it really, really made me grow. Then my last stop was Missouri as a basketball coach, kind of coming home, so to speak, because uh, I'm from, again, East St. Louis, Illinois, so it's only about two hours two hours, maybe 15 minutes from East St. Louis. So that was a, a tre tremendous to be back home, to be around family, but also to to lift the program back up, so to speak, and do my job. And we had some good times there. And here we are today. And all of it, and that's why I said all those experiences, they all count because they lead up to something and they get you all where you are today. And my experience today, to be able to sit here and talk with you, uh, a tremendous, wonderful audience of people, to talk to you about it all counts the life experiences. I can actually now take my daughter to school every day. And all my experience of coaching a lot of phenomenal student athletes and been around a lot of wonderful people, commentators, coaches, analysts, you name it. I get a chance to take my daughter to school every day to be able to pour into her, even though she's probably not listening all the time because she have her headphones on, but to be able to pour into her and to have the opportunity to stop and breathe. And for 22 years as a head coach, not even just simply smelling the flowers. Uh, don't have to take a phone call. Don't have to return a text. Just to sit back and say, man, this is what it's all about. All the hours you put into it on and off the court. This is what it's all about. The sacrifices my wife and I made for us to be here to this day. This is what it all is all about. So you sit there and say, does it matter? Yes, it all counts. 
every little thing matters. And to be here today is a, a wonderful experience. And I, I welcome you, my audience, and I hope we can have a great ride for a long time. Thank you all for joining me today on this wonderful podcast. This is a joyous ride for me, and I'm looking forward to it for a long time. This has been on my heart for a while. It feels good to be a part of it. And to be able to settle down as a coach, a leader, a father, a teacher, and a lifelong learner, uh, we will grow together. We will experience the highs and lows of it all because it all counts. The journey has always been a blessing for me to now even to transition to no longer coaching, uh, to be able to experience life with my wife, my daughter, my two sons are older, to get a chance to do a lot of traveling, the things I wasn't able to do, uh, you know, I've missed birthdays, I've missed parties, I've missed celebrations for years. And to experience all that now has been so much fun. And I want to share all that with you guys, my experience, the ups, downs, the highs and lows, because it's a part of it. And it's what helps us grow, it makes us who we are. And we touch so many people in our lives, we impact so many. And again, just to simply be able to get up in the morning and take my daughter to school and just to see her, to experience what she's going through, because um, I missed a lot when she was growing up, you know, trying to build and, and develop programs to help young men grow from boys to men and have successful lives and careers to, again, to here we are now. It all counts, and I enjoy it. I'm looking forward to this journey. We will take it one day at a time. We will dive into a lot of different topics. We'll have phenomenal guests. And, again, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to It All Counts, the podcast where we learn and grow together. Thank you, and have a great day.